Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation, or any part thereof, is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Biotest. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Stuart Adler at Virginia Commonwealth University and the CMB Research Foundation in Richmond, Virginia in the States. This educational program uh, re is regarding the principles and best practices to prevent congenital CMB infection and disease. In this program, I will be discussing the epidemiology and disease burden of CMV, uh, congenital, only congenital infection, current practices for preventing transmission, the use of high dose hyperimmune globulin to prevent fetal infection and disease, and the future trends, including the development of vaccines. Now, cytomegalovirus is one of the most common viruses uh, worldwide. Uh, for the most part, it ca doesn't cause any disease. And in most countries, particularly developing countries, 80 to 90 percent of patients or individuals have had a CMV infection uh, at some time in their life, usually in childhood. In uh, the general population in the United States and in Canada and Europe, 30 to 50 percent of individuals will be infected, will have been infected with CMV. For those who are uninfected, there's an annual seroconversion rate, and that rate averages about 1.6% uh, uh, worldwide, and, but it can be higher or lower uh, depending on geographical location. Now, congenital CMV infections are the most common congenital infections worldwide. On average, about 1% of infants are infected with CMV on the day of birth and uh, shed the virus in uh, urine, saliva, and have it in the blood. For the most part, these children uh, are completely normal at birth and will remain normal throughout their life with no side effects from the CMV infection. However, for some infants who are congenitally infected, there will be serious deficits, including hearing deficit, mental retardation, and developmental delay, and uh, even death. These are the uh, sequelae or uh, problems that we seek to prevent in trying to uh, uh, evaluate uh, this infection. The signs and symptoms may be of CMV infection may be present at birth. Common signs and uh, symptoms include being small for gestational age, a small head, enlarged liver and spleen, uh, elevated direct bilirubin, low platelets, and uh, neurosensory and hearing deficits. Less common are, is involvement of the eye or a blueberry muffin rash, where the rash is due to extra medullary hematopoiesis occurring in the skin, as well as uh, central nervous, evidence of central nervous system infection uh, as manifested by calcifications, usually detected by ultrasound or head CT. All of these manifestations, with the exception of hearing deficit, reflect the fact that the, uh, the fetus, that the placenta, which nourishes the fetus, has been infected in utero, and the baby has become hypoxic and or malnourished, hence uh, these uh, signs and symptoms of CMV at birth. All of these signs and symptoms are reversible, so they will go away and in and of themselves are not particularly a problem with the exception of neuro hearing, neurosensory hearing deficit. Now, preconceptual immunity, that is, has the mother, did the mother have a CMV infection prior to the time that she conceived uh, or became pregnant is very important. For uh, fetal infection rates for mothers who are immune to CMV uh, prior to conception, only one to 2% will uh, transmit the virus uh, to their fetus. 
But if a mother is not immune, that is she lacks antibodies to CMV, then approximately half of these women over the course of a pregnancy will uh, transmit the virus from uh, themselves uh, to the fetus. Uh, with the highest rates of transmission occurring in the last trimester and the lowest rates, about 33% in the first trimester. Now, infection of the fetus does not necessarily mean the fetus will have disease. That is, the fetus may still be infected in utero and, uh, and uh, be absolutely normal at birth and normal on follow-up. Disease rates, however, are uh, more common. Higher disease rates are more common among women who um, were uh, not immune to CMV prior to pregnancy. So for women who were, were immune, less than 10% of their children will have uh, problems. But for women who were not immune, it could be as much as one third. This is a very common problem in, uh, the, United, in the United States. The, uh, our Centers for Disease Control estimates about five to 6,000 babies a year will have congenital CMV and develop long-term medical conditions. This rate is more common than it occurs for fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome, or spina bifida. CMV is also the most common uh, infectious cause of neurological damage in infancy, more common than uh, rubella, uh, haemophilus, or herpes simplex. So in all, it is a very serious public health problem. This slide is from uh, Walter Nance, who attempted to estimate the frequency of CMV infections associated with deafness, both deafness present at birth and so-called prelingual deafness, which is deafness which occurs uh, before, uh, before the age of four, but is not present at birth. In both si situations, that is deafness at birth and prelingual deafness, he estimates that between 20 and 25% of all hearing deficit can be attributed to CMV infection uh, either uh, in, in utero. Furthermore, the hearing deficit associated with CMV uh, can be progressive. So you can have mild or moderate at birth and become severe. You can have no hearing deficit at birth and it develops postnatally. Needless to say, we do not understand the pathogenesis of uh, hearing deficits associated with a congenital CMV infection. So who's at high risk for having a baby who is going to become affected? Well, the major high risk are pregnant women who have not had a previous CMV infection uh, at the time that they become pregnant. Uh, exposure to young children uh, constitutes the risk because most pregnant women will acquire 75% or more of pregnant women will acquire this infection from their own uh, child. Why is that? It's because children less than three years of age who acquire CMV postnatally excrete CMV in urine and saliva for a long time, six to 42 months with an average of 18 months. Women who are seronegative to CMV and who have infected children acquire the infection at rates 10 to 20, 25 times higher than other women. We don't know for sure that CMV is uh, transmitted venereally or by sexual contact, but if it is, it should be easily prevented by barrier methods. This slide shows the results of a vaccine study where a vaccine called GBMF59 was evaluated for its ability to prevent mothers from acquiring a CMV infection after having given birth. So what was done was that a mother gave birth to a child and in the six months postpartum, she was given a series of injections of the vaccine to uh, try to prevent her from becoming infected. And uh, so all of the women, 441, had a young child at home at the time that they were given the vaccine. And then these children were followed prospectively for over three years to look at the rates of acquisitions by the mothers uh, for getting a CMV infection. This is the first uh, randomized placebo control trial that was been done. In fact, it's the only one so far that has been done and designed to look at efficacy. In this study, the rate of CMV infection was 50% lower among women who received 
the uh, vaccine rather than placebo. But it appears that most of the protection occurred in the first year following immunization. And then, um, and then the rates uh, uh, plateaued for the duration of the study, which was an additional two to three years. So this efficacy was not high enough to lead to licensure, but it was high enough to spur interest in developing a CMV. And many companies are now engaged in uh, CMV vaccine uh, research, trying to hope, hoping to develop a vaccine which can be used uh, globally. This slide shows the rate of transmission of CMV from a child who is shedding the virus to his mother who's never had the infection. So the mother is susceptible, seronegative. The children are infected, usually acquired with daycare. So what this slide shows is that the rate of infection uh, is, is related to the age of the child. So for example, if the child is less than 21 months of age, in about 12 months, over half of the mothers will acquire the infection from their child. If the child is over 21 months of age, then in 12 months, probably less than 15% or so of the women will become infected. So the age of the child is quite important uh, for assessing the risk to the mother. Unfortunately, many women will become pregnant with a second, third, or even fourth child uh, within the first year of giving of uh, the time their child uh, uh, starts shedding a CMV. There have been three studies now looking at how to interrupt this child to mother transmission. Each study has been quite successful and has uh, found efficacy rates varying from 80 to 95%. Uh, percent. Uh, each, uh, each study is very different in terms of its uh, study design. And uh, this slide shows the results from one study, the most recent one, uh, by Ravello et al., published in 2015. And that's, this study was randomized, but the randomization was, for, for technical reasons, had to be by hospital rather than subject. But nevertheless, they observed a transmission rate from mothers who were seronegative uh, entering pregnancy, who had a child shedding CMV. There was 7.6% rate in the control group compared to a 1.2% rate in the uh, uh, intervention group. And uh, the p-value was highly significant. What was the intervention? Well, in all of the studies, the intervention has been the same. And we call it the uh, do's and don'ts of how to prevent uh, getting CMV from your own child. Do assume that your child in daycare has CMV in their urine and saliva. Do wash your hands thoroughly after the following activities, which are listed on the slide. And finally, do not engage in the following activities, which includes kissing your child on the mouth, sleeping with your child, or sharing food or food utensils. About 20 years ago, we did a study to see what the risk could be, and we identified 151 CMV seronegative children and um, simply asked of these women, uh, seronegative women, how many had a child shedding CMV? So the mother is seronegative, the child is shedding CMV. What's the prevalence in the population of shedding children among C pregnant CMV seronegative women? And the answer was 25%, 37 of 151. I have no reason to think that's changed over the years. So I think it's still a good estimate that women who have a young child, uh, in, particularly in daycare, and are pregnant uh, have a risk for getting this infection. This is a summary slide that just shows what happens uh, in our studies. We uh, uh, had 37 uh, pregnant women uh, who had a child setting CMV who received the uh, hygienic precautions I just uh, showed you, and uh, of that 37, only one became infected. If a mother is not pregnant, then 64 of 154 got infected from the child, in spite of being told to practice uh, the hygienic precautions. So non-pregnant women, we have never been able to uh, get them to change their behaviors uh, to avoid getting infected, which is fine because uh, infection of non-pregnant women is not a problem. 
but you can only use these precautions when a woman is pregnant and knows that she is susceptible. Now I want to turn to the question of how to uh, prevent the fetus from getting infected after the mother becomes infected. So how do you reduce the transmission rate uh, from um, mother to uh, child uh, during pregnancy? Now the first study that looked at this was a study done by Negro et al. And in that study, they used a CMV hyperimmune globulin. CMV hyperimmune globulin is an antibody preparation that's enriched about twofold in antibodies to CMV over normal serum. So it's called hyperimmune globulin. And uh, that product has been around since the 1980s and it's been used primarily in uh, renal transplant uh, patients. So uh, in that study, which was a prospective study, but not a randomized study, they observed, and it was a phase one study that for safety and efficacy, they observed that about 16% uh, of women who had received the HIG uh, were uh, uh, transmitted the virus to their child, compared to a 40% rate for women who did not receive the immunoglobulin. The immunoglobulin was given at 100 units per woman per infusion at an interval of uh, every, every month. So it was, what was actually happened was a woman would become pregnant. She would go to her gynecologist or obstetrician, uh, and he would test for CMV at the beginning of pregnancy, approximately four to eight weeks to station. If that test showed the mother lacked antibodies to CMV, the obstetrician would get another test a month later or a month after that or a month after that. So obstetricians, and this study was in Italy, identify women who were seronegative at the beginning of pregnancy and then who became infected during pregnancy. These women, once they seroconverted, that is they went from CMV sero negative to CMV sero positive, they were given um, immune globulin and, uh, and the infection rates of the fetus were looked at either at amniocentesis at uh, around 20 weeks or of gestation or at uh, delivery. So there was a, a good suggestion in this study that CMV uh, immunoglobulin, when used at 100 milligrams per kilogram, was effective. Subsequently, it was uh, found that the uh, half-life, the anticipated half-life, and the uh, dose that was used were incorrect. This is the 100 milligrams per uh, kilogram dose and uh, given every month uh, after maternal infection. And what happens is that there are peaks and troughs uh, occurring and uh, uh, so you get a very high, you get a, a temporary but high boost in antibody levels to CMV, which diminish uh, rapidly. It turns out that the published data on the half-life and peak and kinetics of uh, uh, CMV hyperimmune globulin were actually done uh, using uh, anti, by measuring anti-hepatitis B antibodies rather than uh, anti-CMV antibodies. This turns out to have been, probably been a mistake, uh, and it certainly was a mistake, because when you look at anti-CMV antibodies in women who receive the hyperimmune globulin, the kinetics is quite different as shown on this slide. You can see that once the hyperimmune globulin is given, there's a rapid rise in the levels of anti-CMV antibodies. These more or less plateau out for a period of a, a couple of weeks and then increase when a second uh, dose is given. So um, the half-life of this uh, uh, compound is actually about 10 or 11 days as opposed to 23 days. So it's about half what was uh, originally thought. Um, and also the, um, the, the maximum dose uh, is achieved when you give to 200 milligrams per kilogram uh, dose. Now, what about studies of uh, hyperimmune globulin to prevent con congenital infection? 
Well, I've already discussed with you the first study, which was the Negro study. It was the low dose that was used in that study. The study also used the high dose to treat uh, infants that were congenitally infected. So this is uh, somewhat of an error. And I showed you that the results from that trial, 16% uh, rate among the infants who received no immunoglobulin compared to a 40% rate among those that received the immunoglobulin. Subsequently, there was a uh, retrospective analysis by Buxman uh, that wasn't particularly useful, but it did show that the uh, uh, infection rate among uh, uh, women who received immunoglobulin was around 22%. Then there was a randomized placebo control trial, also done in Italy, also done with the low dose of the hyperimmune globulin uh, given monthly. And uh, in that study, there was a partial efficacy. The rate of fetal infection was 30% among treated mothers compared with 40%, 44% for untreated mothers. P was only 1.3. Now, this protocol of Ravello was identical to the protocol of Negro in every way, except that the subjects were randomized to receive placebo or uh, hyperimmune globulin. The fact that the protocols were identical made it possible to combine the two studies, the results of the two studies, and increase the number of subjects that were being analyzed. When that was done, the effectiveness of the hyperimmune globulin was quite obvious, and P was like 0 0.0001. Subsequently, a, uh, another study was done with the high dose, was done using high dose uh, hyperimmune globulin, which was given twice per month or biweekly. This was also a retrospective but uh, analysis uh, in, a, in the sense that it was a case control study. Uh, and once again, the results were quite encouraging with a 12% rate among women who received the immune globulin, that is the treatment group, and the control rate was 84%. So uh, the p-value was quite significant. Subsequent to that, in, in 2019, Kagan et al. did a uh, uh, prospective study uh, using high dose immunoglobulin, uh, given by, also given biweekly. And they observed that of 130 subjects that they've enrolled to date, they published 40, but they've accru accrued an additional 90. They had an inf overall infection rate of 10 of 130. I'll show you in a minute their protocol, but it was very rigorous. Uh, they had a 38% rate among untreated uh, women, that is, 38% of women with a primary infection in early gestation uh, transmitted this. These were uh, retrospective uh, or historical controls, but the p-value was highly significant. Okay, in 2019, the results of a second study by Negro were published. And in that study, instead of using low-dose uh, hyperimmunoglobulin, they used the high-dose immunoglobulin. It was given uh, bi-weekly average of two infusions per subject. And there, there was a clear impact of the immunoglobulin on the rates of fetal infection, 30% among treated women, 57% among untreated women. Finally, there was a, a randomized placebo control trial using low dose uh, immunoglobulin. Uh, and uh, the results of that trial are shown here. And uh, they found no effect whatsoever of the immunoglobulin. This study was done in the USA. All the previous studies have been done in Europe. Being done in the USA, they used a different product. There were several problems with the study, including using the wrong dose, the wrong interval, and selection of subjects based on uh, antibody avidity rather than seroconversion. Uh, and their rate in the control group reflected this because it was only 19%, uh, which is the lowest that has been published. This is mostly due to the fact that many of the babies were already infected at the time the immunoglobulin was administered, or this is at least likely to be the case. This is the Kagan study, which was highly effective. And I put this up here to show that they were very rigorous in terms of when these people were uh, treated and how they were treated. So the average gestational age at the time of infection was identified 
the average was 9.6 weeks. By 11.1 .1 weeks, these patients were treated with the immunoglobulin. This is the frequency of administration and uh, other uh, information. So they, uh, they observed initially one of 40 women got infected. They now observed that 10 of 130, the same rate of about 7% uh, when the high dose is used and used early in gestation. Finally, the uh, second Negro study that I mentioned enrolled 304 women. Uh, seroconversion was used uh, to identify the infection uh, or symptoms of laboratory ab abnormalities occasionally used for a few subjects. This study uh, evaluated 31 covariates, just a few of which are listed on this slide, to try to uh, use uh, statistical model modeling to determine which variates were predictive of fetal infection. And uh, when that was uh, looked at, there were only four that independently of the others predicted fetal infection. One was looking at low, low avidity, uh, as shown on uh, this slide. Another was uh, whether the mothers had received immunoglobulin. And the answer was clear. If the mothers received immunoglobulin, we had a rate of 30% compared to 54%. DNAemia was an important predictor, and ultrasound abnormalities were uh, uh, very important predictors of uh, congenital infection. We looked at, in this study, we uh, was looked at uh, symptoms at birth, uh, whether or not the immunoglobulin was received was an important predictor. And again, ultrasound findings was an important predictor. Finally, the most important variable is how did these children do in the long term? Follow-up was to an average of age four years here, and there were two predictors of outcome here. Whether or not the mother received immunoglobulin, rate of 30% versus 4%. So if a mother did not get immunoglobulin, she had a 30% chance of having an affected child, but if she got immunoglobulin, it was reduced to 2.4%. Ultrasound findings were also important. Finally, high dose immunoglobulin has been used to treat babies that are already infected in pregnancy and are identified either through amniocentesis or ultrasound findings. And this, uh, these rates in three studies listed here have been quite encouraging with rates varying from 75 to over 90% uh, efficacy. There's also a paper in the literature, phase one paper, using val uh, acyclovir to treat babies already infected in utero. They had a good result with 34 or 43 babies, 80% uh, having um, being asymptomatic at birth when, when they were diseased uh, in utero. So this is an initial study, uh, which is encouraging 80% uh, efficacy compared to 43% in historical controls. So we can say that maternal viremia may predict fetal infection, and this may be helpful for patient counseling. High dose immunoglobulin prevents fetal infection, neonatal symptoms, and long-term disabilities. Ideally, however, we'd like to have an active vaccine that induces antibodies against CMV, and uh, this is feasible. So the future looks like we hope that we'll have an active vaccine. The advantages to an active vaccine is it could provide universal immunization, uh, could prevent child-to-mother transmission and child-to-child -child transmission, could also benefit other classes of patients, such as transplant patients, the elderly, heart disease, et cetera. And uh, it also uh, would be widely enough acceptable that it would be uh, economically uh, feasible. The problems with an active vaccine is that it may not protect women who are seropositive. And some of these women can have an affected child, although it's not particularly common. Multiple doses will probably be needed. We won't know the immunity, the duration of immunity to CMV induced by a vaccine until we have a, a sufficient time to monitor it. And the vaccine will have to be given to many women or many individuals who themselves will not directly benefit from the vaccine. So the, what are the future trends for uh, congenital infection using polyclonal passive vaccines? Uh, that is the hyperimmune globulin that's twofold enriched in antibodies to CMV. The advantages to uh, the hyperimmune globulin 
are that it will neutralize, that it will inactivate multiple genotypes and diverse isotypes of CMV because the product is made from many individuals who are infected with many types of CMV. This uh, product will obviously, as I've showed you today today, should prevent or reduce fetal infection. It will also treat infected fetuses and uh, it appears to be safe and there have been several uh, safety studies completed. The disadvantages to the polyclonal antibody are that it needs to be given intravenously, frequently at high cost. Multiple doses are needed due to the short half-life of uh, 10 or 11 days. It doesn't protect uh, uh, everybody and it can only be given to those who are already inf infected. So there is no universal immunization and it can't be used prophylactically that is, it can't be used to prevent mothers from getting CMV infections from their child. I'd like to thank you for watching. Uh, I encourage you to answer the questions and complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.